Sup, Chooms? How y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, recently I've been doing research on a video about 2.5 milligrams of dutasteride, but apparently the only thing anyone wants to talk about these days is using topical sugar to regrow their hair. I've got to be honest with you, Chooms. This topic isn't particularly endearing or interesting to me, since even taking a cursory glance at the research here, I could tell it is pretty overhyped, but since nobody is going to leave me alone about it until I make a video covering this subject, I might as well get this over with. I'm just kidding. You know I love talking about this shit, Chums. So, as it turns out, to my great surprise, this isn't just another theory that explains everything on Reddit. No, there is some actual legitimate scientific research on this rather than just a bunch of optimistic speculation online. Now, it isn't human research we're talking about here, Chums, but at least it's actual science rather than just some blowhard Redditor claiming to have found the next broccoli or castor oil miracle. Okay, so now that you've heard about that, are you guys certain that you really want me to make a video about this? Fine, I will, but that's only because I like you guys and I aim to please. The 2.5 milligram dutasteride video could wait a few more days, I suppose. So, let's go ahead and go balls deep into this research, and I promise I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. Well, this sugar study was being hyped up all over the media recently, like this article here that is titled, quote, Hair loss hope, natural sugar stimulates significant regrowth, unquote. And here's another article from the BBC titled, quote, Scientists may have finally found a cheap natural cure for baldness, unquote. But the actual research study behind all this is based on this one here titled, quote, Stimulation of hair regrowth in an animal model of androgen alopecia using 2-deoxy-D ribose, unquote. So keep in mind, like I said, that this is just a mouse study. It's not a human study. That doesn't make it worthless by any stretch of the imagination, but it is still very preliminary research we're talking about here, Chums. Also, we're not exactly talking about rubbing table sugar on our scalps. This is a very specific type of sugar. Specifically, it is called 2-deoxy-D ribose, and you can see the formula right here. But this isn't some rare, obscure type of sugar either. It's actually a sugar that is found in our DNA. So, in the article, the investigators abbreviate the name of the sugar to 2-D-D-R are, and I'll do that too. Apparently, these investigators were doing research on using the sugar to promote wound healing, and they noticed, incidentally, that there seemed to be a stimulation of hair growth in the areas adjacent to the wounds. So it kind of reminds me of the story of topical minoxidil, or minoxidil, where they were using it for controlling blood pressure, but then they found out by accident that it causes hair growth. But anyways, based on the researchers' previous experiments, the investigators have a theory that 2-DDR stimulates a growth factor called VEGF, which stands for Vascular Endothelial Growth Factor. Factor. VEGF stimulates the growth of the capillary blood vessels that supply blood to the hair follicles. We know from studies that VEGF is suppressed in both men and women with androgenic alopecia. In fact, suppressing VEGF is one of the downstream effects of increased DHT levels in the hair follicles. This is what leads to the regression and the destruction of the capillaries that give blood to the hair follicles, which then leads to miniaturization and the eventual death of the hair follicles. So, the theory behind 2-DDR is that it could increase VEGF in the hair follicles and therefore help prevent this loss of capillaries that occurs as a consequence of increased scalp DHT in androgenic alopecia. Now keep in mind here, Chums, that this is not the blood flow theory that we're talking about. In the blood flow theory, it is the large blood vessels of the scalp that are supposedly squeezed off by the tight muscles or tight gallia apoderotica, and this is what's supposedly what causes hair loss, but it's all complete bullshit, of course. In reality, there is no limitation of blood flow in these large blood vessels, and since I brought up the blood flow theory, I'll go ahead and link some videos below explaining why it is a bullshit obsolete theory. But getting back to the point of this video, when we look at the sugar study, the investigators theorized that 2-DDR would stimulate VEGF and thus stimulate hair growth. So, the first thing the researchers did was develop a specific hydrogel containing as a base a compound called sodium alginate. The researchers prepared a placebo version version of the gel and a version containing 2-DDR. They showed that the gel released the 2-DDR slowly over a period of 96 hours. The researchers chose a very special strain of mice that develop hair loss when given androgens like DHT or testosterone. This is a bit more useful than a regular mouse model since it is a mouse model that simulates androgenic alopecia in humans. Anyways, these mice developed hair loss just by injecting them every other day with testosterone for two weeks. After two weeks of getting testosterone, 
testosterone treatment, the hair of the mice was removed using a hair removal cream. The mice were then divided into six groups. The first group were just the mice who didn't get testosterone or any other treatment. These were the normal control mice. The next group, called Group T1, were androgenic alopecia mice who got no treatment at all. Group T2 were androgenic alopecia mice who got the placebo version of the gel. Group T3 were androgenic alopecia mice who got the gel that contained the sugar 2-DDR. Group T4 were androgenic alopecia mice who got 2% topical minoxidil. And finally, Group T5 got topical 2% minoxidil plus the sugar gel. So that's a lot of different groups we're talking about here, Chomes. But I got to be honest, it is a little bit disappointing to me and frustrating that the investigators chose just 2% minoxidil. I mean, we know 2% minoxidil works, but almost nobody uses it anymore these days because we know that 5% topical minoxidil is a lot better. There are already plenty of mouse studies that use 5% topical minoxidil, so why couldn't they use it here? It used to be that 5% minoxidil was the brand marketed towards men, and 2% minoxidil was marketed towards women, but these days, both men and women will typically use 5% topical minoxidil, and that is because we know from randomized controlled studies that 5% minoxidil is superior to 2% minoxidil. The only people who should even consider using 2% minoxidil are people who get side effects from 5% minoxidil, which isn't common, but it does happen. Anyways, the treatments were continued for 20 days, and then the results were analyzed. So let's see what the investigators found. Here's the figure showing the main results looking at the hair growth in the mice. Let's take a look at the row labeled 21st day. So. If you look at the column labeled NC, these were the normal control mice who did not have androgenic alopecia and they grew back all their hair normally after 21 days. If you look at the columns T1 and T2, these were the mice who had androgenic alopecia and who got no treatment or just the placebo gel. They didn't grow back their hair very well. The last three columns show better hair growth that is closer to the normal control mice. Column T3 is the 2DDR group, T4 is the 2% topical minoxidil group, and T5 is a combination of 2-DDR and minoxidil. One way to measure the results is by looking at the skin color changes of the mice. The reason why this matters for mice is because mice have a synchronized hair growth cycle, which is completely different from humans where the hair growth cycle is unsynchronized. But also, in the case of mice, the skin darkens when the hair enters the antigen growth phase because of melanin production. So, this graph here looks at the changes in skin color in the different groups over time. As you can see in groups T1 and T2, which are the two groups with androgenic alopecia that weren't treated, the antigen phase had not been reached at day 20, while in all three treated groups, meaning group T3, T4, and T5, the antigen growth phase was achieved, similar to what happened in the normal control mice. When the investigators measured hair length and thickness in the sugar group, it was similar to the control group. When the actual hair diameter was measured, the greatest diameter was in the normal control group. After that, it was followed by the minoxidil group, and then the sugar group, and then finally, the minoxidil plus sugar group. The hair diameter in all the treated groups was better than the untreated androgenic alopecia mice. It was also found with 2-DDR that there was an increase in the ratio of antigen to telogen hairs, meaning that 2-DDR was keeping hairs in the antigen growth phase. There were also more blood vessels found in the skin in the 2-DDR and minoxidil groups. So even though the investigators speculated that 2-DDR might do all this by increasing the levels of the growth factor VEGF, they didn't actually measure VEGF in this study. So the investigators concluded that 2-DDR stimulated hair growth in mice with androgenic alopecia and that it might work by stimulating VEGF production, though they did not verify the mechanism of how it actually works. The researchers felt that the results with 2 DDR were similar to using topical minoxidil, though I should point out again most disappointingly, the researchers used a weaker version of topical minoxidil, just 2% instead of 5% topical minoxidil, which is considered the standard dose these days for both men and women. I mean, why would they do that? Wouldn't most of them prefer to know how this treatment compares to the type of minoxidil that most people actually use? I don't know. Anyways, when it comes to how it compares to 2% topical minoxidil, the investigators felt that 2 DDR achieved about 8 80 to 90% of the efficacy of 2% topical minoxidil. So it isn't even as good as 2% minoxidil. Now, I know some of you in the comments section are about to write, but Kevin, even if it isn't as good as minoxidil, could it possibly be stacked with it to make it more effective? Sadly, the answer
answer to that question seems to be no. This isn't like stamoxidine where using it with minoxidil has a synergistic benefit. Using 2-DDR along with topical minoxidil didn't have any increased benefits. In fact, some parameters looked even worse when the two treatments were combined, which makes this treatment completely worthless for minoxidil users. So, in light of all this information, is it possible that this sugary treatment is going to live up to all the hype it has received in the online media? Well, let's examine some of the pros and cons. First of all, the good news here is that this kind of treatment is very cheap, it's readily available, and it probably doesn't have any adverse side effects. The downside, though, is that we have absolutely no human studies to verify the results in this mouse model, and the mouse model doesn't even show very good results to begin with. Even though this is a mouse model that simulates antrogenic alopecia in humans, it isn't actually antrogenic alopecia we're talking about, and there are likely to be interspecies differences that haven't been accounted for yet. Because of these interspecies differences between mice and men, we have no idea if 2-DDR would work in humans with actual antrogenic alopecia. But the biggest problem of all is that this stuff just doesn't seem to be all that powerful. It falls a little short of equaling 2% topical minoxidil, which we know is less powerful than 5% topical minoxidil that most people use nowadays. Also, it looks like there is no synergistic effect by adding 2-DDR to topical minoxidil similar to other treatments like tretinoin or stamoxidine. That is a little strange to me, since when hair growth stimulants work by different mechanisms, that usually means means that they will have an additional hair growth benefit when they are used together, but using 2-DDR and topical minoxidil together doesn't have that benefit. In fact, it seems to make things even worse. So there is literally no benefit to using this treatment for minoxidil users, and that's even assuming these mouse studies apply to humans anyways, which we don't know yet. So if this turns out to be an effective treatment in human studies, then it might play a role as an alternative growth stimulant to topical minoxidil in people who don't tolerate minoxidil very well. And that's that counts for something because I know there are some people who can't use topical minoxidil, but for the majority of people who can use topical minoxidil, 2-DDR certainly doesn't look like it is something that would be useful to add to your hair loss stack. You're much better off just using 5% topical minoxidil instead since we know it works a lot better since even 2% minoxidil works better than the sugar stuff. But if I'm being completely honest, I'm actually pretty pleasantly surprised by this whole thing. You know, I expected this treatment to be an absolute joke, kind of like the whole broccoli thing was. But but I was actually surprised. Even though this stuff is being overhyped online, it does seem like it has some potential utility as a weaker, but still slightly effective minoxidil alternative for those who can't use minoxidil as their primary hair growth stimulant. The next step, of course, will be some human studies, and I'll be especially curious to see if these outcomes from the animal models hold up when the treatment is tested on actual human beings. So... All right, hair loss witchers, I think that's enough about sugar today. Hopefully there won't be any more distractions because next up will be my video on the elite within the Dutasteride Master Race, 2.5 milligrams of Dutasteride. Until then, thank you all for watching. God bless.